Ine matu gumana him shabda kingam na khan. Ine matu gumana him shabda kingam na khan. Ine matu shabda kingam na khan. Ine matu shabda kingam na khan. Ine matu gumana him. Shevera kingam yachad, ine matovu manahim. Shevera kingam yachad, ine matov, ine matov. La 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 la. Ine matov, ine matov. La 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 la. Ine matov. Behold how good and how pleasant it is The brethren to dwell together Behold how good and how pleasant it is The brethren to dwell together In unity, to dwell in unity La 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 In unity, to dwell in unity La 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 Hey! What? You were expecting kippahs and toras and shofars and everything else? Oh, please. God don't care. God just wants you to be there. Let's try a little unity, you know, like, hey, bless them if they're doing their thing, you know, and they're going to go out there and kind of like, you know, like, let's go to Godspell and listen to a contemporary shofar. I like Godspell. That's what I grew up on. But, I know, there are those who can't take the blessing of contemporary and have to be into the oh, Hebraic root. Get down in the dirt, find your roots, dig down deep enough into that soil and you're going to find something. Some worms too, you know. But, okay, if you really want to go to Rosh Hashanah there, and you really want to do it all there, God bless you. Hey, enjoy it. Such as it is, it is. Such a deal. You should be so lucky that God gives you freedom and grace to do what you want to do. And when you get through, God will take care of you. <laughs> you know, the love is what unifies us. The grace is what makes us one in the Spirit, one in the Lord. The mercy that God has given us is what brings us together as a people of God, as a family of God. Because the 12 tribes, they weren't one in agreement. The 12 tribes actually were at each other's throats lots of times, just like the brethren of any household would be. So don't get too carried away about thinking that you have to have everybody perfect cookie cutter right to be in the body of Christ. No time and no place did Israel, all twelve brethren, work as one and were righteous before God and holy. But rather, they were individuals, as you and I are. So learn to extend the grace for grace, the mercy for mercy, the forgiveness and the kindness that you have in Jesus. If God has so tenderized your heart that he's allowed you the perspective of being one of those who can bless the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all of your strength. And in so doing, cause jealousy to provoke the Jew to return to his God. For surely I say unto you that this day, the Yom Truach, don't go out and try to be a super Jew. Don't go out and try to be a super Christian. Just Pray that God would reveal himself to his people in Jesus. You don't have to make it into Yahoo or Yahushua, which is really his name. By the way, every time you hear these guys that go Yahoo or Yahoo they're wrong. It's simple. Jesus' name was very simple. It's always been simple. It's in Hebrew. It's Yahushua, God of salvation. It's where we get Joshua from. It's a very simple, common name. 
Jesus didn't make it into some specialized, we got to add an extra vowel and consonant because we're going to make it into Yahoo. You know, or we don't know we're not going to make it a Yahweh thing or a Yahweh thing and a ya 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 thing. But rather, it's always been as simple as reading your Bible. You know it. It's Joshua. He is like Joshua. He's like, you know, guess what? Coming as the conquering king, you know, and Jesus in shortening Yahushua, as is common in his day, was Yeshua, which was, hey, it's not so bad, you know, we call Michael Mike, the same thing's true, Yehoshua, Joshua, we call Yeshua, Jesus, Jesus is Joshua, Joshua is Jesus, Yeshua is Yehoshua, he would have been Yehoshua ben Yosef in temple, or Yehoshua ben Davi, the son of David. Because a lot of times, being a son of David, you were given exception to be of the house of the kingdom so that you would have the preference for reading. And so there are lots of titles, and none of them have a Yahuhus in them. So I'm sorry. On some things, you can't go there. You know, I just can't add an extra consonant and vowel to a name that has been all along in Scripture, even in Isaiah, and the scrolls are now online so that we can get rid of some of these things that are way off base. So don't get carried away into some weird sect or some weird denomination or some weird roots, but balance out the joy of Jesus, the beautiful Davidic dance, the graciousness of our God to allow the expression of our heart to develop according to our understanding of who He is as we trust in Him with all our heart, leaning not into our own understanding, but in all our ways acknowledging Him and let Him direct our path. For not everyone is a dancer, not everyone is a singer, not everyone is a Jew, not everyone is a Gentile, not everyone is a man, not everyone is a woman, not everyone is a barbarian, not everyone is a Scythian, not everyone is free. Thank God. <laughs> I wouldn't want it any other way. The go of unconditional identification. My utmost for his highest. One thing you lack, come, take up your cross, follow me, Mark 10.21. The rich young ruler had the master passion to be perfect. Oh, he wanted to be perfect. He wanted to be right. He wanted to be holy. Holy cow. When he saw Jesus Christ, he wanted to be like him. Our Lord never puts personal holiness to the forefront when he calls a disciple. He puts absolute annihilation of my rights to myself and makes identification with himself absolute. A relationship with himself in which there is no other relationship. Luke 14, 26. My gospel is very simple. You trust in the Lord with all your heart. You lean not in your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he'll direct your path because I can't tell you how much the gospel has been changed in order to make it palatable and easier for people to follow Jesus. And I'm glad. Follow Jesus as much as you want to. But there comes a time where you no longer follow Jesus, but Jesus begins to tell you what it means to be his disciple. That's when you become a Christian. Because before that, you're just a follower. The crowds follow Jesus. Thousands came to be healed by him, and they were healed. Has Jesus healed you? I'm glad. Praise the Lord. Maybe you'll go to heaven. Has Jesus touched your life? Great, I'm glad. Maybe you'll find salvation. Has Jesus spoken to you and you thought he was like, wow, this must be the Son of God. Praise the Lord. I'm happy for you. You might become a disciple of Jesus. But when the crowds were told by Jesus what to do, they walked away and would not follow him anymore. So there comes a time and a place where the reality of your salvation is put into a determination of will you do what Jesus said? 
because I'm sorry if the gospel was presented to you in such a way that it only made you a follower from a distance, but it didn't make you a disciple up close and personal. It wasn't my choice, and it would never be my decision to tell you that you were saved, except that you know Jesus and he tells you that himself. Because he said, there would come those that would say that they've done all these things in his name, and he tells them, depart from me, I never knew you. That is a terrifying place to be. To hear the Son of God look you in the eye and say, I don't know you. God help us to fall on his mercy and grace so we never hear those words from him who we love with all our heart. Then Jesus, beholding him, loved him. The look of Jesus would mean a heart broken forever from allegiance to any other person or any other thing. Has Jesus ever looked at you? Has he ever come to you? Has he personally challenged you right there in the very pit of your heart? The look of Jesus transforms and transfixes. It stops you in your tracks. It's a reality check, letting you know you'll never be the same. Where you are soft with God is where the Lord is looking at you. Where you aren't willing to be obedient is where Jesus begins his work on you. Where you are not willing to let go and let God is where God says that is the measure of your Christianity. If you are hard and vindictive, insistent on your own way, certain that the other person is more likely to be in the wrong than you are, it is an indication that there are whole tracks of your nature that have never been transformed by his gaze. Because you can be vindictive and because you can judge your brother, whom God so loved that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And you do not have the right to challenge any other person's salvation lest you yourself be damned. Can I clarify that? I don't want to make a mistake here so you might interpret me. You do not and were never given the right to judge another man's salvation lest God himself judge you and you find yourself damned. For it is God's salvation that he brings to a person, not man's religion, that he insists upon a person to become something they aren't. It is only for God himself to determine who is saved and who is not. Can we clarify that one last time? It is not your ability, it is not your gift, it is not your calling, it is not your will, it is not your word, it is not your choice to determine who is saved and who is not. You can say what the scripture says, you can repeat what the Bible says, but you can't make a call and determine and say that someone is damned or someone is saved, except that God himself says so. For he alone is the judge of all, and he has given that judgment unto his son, and whom the son has set free, he is free indeed. So when God himself does not allow you that privilege, you have no reason, no right, and no honor, and you have no privilege whatsoever to claim in the name of the Son that some Christian that you don't like is unsaved. Oh, you can ask him to not be a part of your church. You can ask him to not be a part of your ministry. You can set him aside to go do another thing. But you cannot call into question the blood of the Lamb that was slain before the foundations of the world for the salvation of a person who has called upon the name of the Lord to be saved, and that man has been saved by God Almighty. And we are not called to question God. We are not called to question God Almighty. Lest we find ourselves questioned ourselves of what we judge of another person. God did not come into the world to condemn the world. He came into the world that through him the world may be saved. That is the gospel. That is your discipleship. That is what you train people to do.
One thing you lack, and only one good thing from Jesus Christ's point of view, is union with himself and nothing in between. Because you see, when you are one in the Spirit, one in the Lord, when you're connected, you won't make that stupid statement of, oh, I don't think they're saved. I don't think they're a Christian. Lord, they're baptizing in the name of John, you know. Shouldn't we go over there and stop them since we're with you, Jesus? But they're with John. They're not godly. They're not, you know, they're not with us, so they can't be, you know, baptizing. And what did Jesus say? Don't stop them. No man can receive anything except the Father in heaven. Give it to him. But, 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 does that apply to, like, Rick Warren, Chuck Smith, Billy Graham, uh, John MacArthur? No. It can't apply to some of these people I don't like, or I do like, or I don't understand, or I do understand. It can't mean, dare I say, People, women, even? Not, not, not those ones that are like Pentecostal women. We know they're weird. Get over yourself. <laughs> Who are you, old man, that you should judge the Lord your God? Are you Job that you're going to stand before the Lord your God, your maker, and try to tell him how to run the universe? I don't think so. There may be things in heaven going on you haven't a clue about. And your attitude is the only thing that's stopping you from having a personal relationship with Jesus so that he would tell you the same thing face to face. All you need to do is ask him. And the one thing I do, and I ask any man that judges another man. One question I ask them, and they do not answer it. Did Jesus tell you to do that? I ask them over and over again. They'll tell me what well, the scripture says. I'll say, no, no, no. I don't want to know what the scripture says. Did Jesus himself tell you to do what you're doing? And if he didn't, why are you doing it? Because I know why. Jesus didn't tell them to. Because they know as well as I do. The scripture is clear. God is about the salvation of souls. He's not about the condemnation. For that shall come. But by the time it does, every will way and means possible God tries to save to the utmost and he chooses the utmost in us to bring his salvation of caring loving sharing being graceful being merciful being caring enough to lay down our lives for the sake of saving a soul from hell so don't tell me who you're sending to hell. you don't have the authority Sell what you have. I must reduce myself until I am mere conscious man. I must fundamentally resonate, renounce all possessions of all kinds, not to save my soul, for only one thing saves a man, absolute reliance upon Jesus Christ. But in order to follow Jesus, the come and follow me, the road is the way he went. He didn't come back and build a kingdom and then save his possessions so that he could go out on temporary ministry duty. But rather, he said, deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow me. The biggest challenge in our lives is to trust in the Lord with all our heart, lean not in our own understanding, in all our ways acknowledge him and let him direct our path, because it's very obvious, very quickly, very immediately, whether or not the Lord is directing your life, or you are. Because sometimes, as tragic as it is, I don't see the blessings, you know, necessarily of a wealthy man being following the Lord absolutely, but rather I see him hedging his bets, setting aside his comforts, and playing games with God when they need to recognize that it is absolutely crucial that we do all we can as fast as we can as long as we can, until the day Jesus comes again, that we give our lives over to Jesus for all that we are, 
both to live with the Father and Jesus as they are, and to live with each other, one in the Spirit. For if we are, then we have no fear of health, wealth, poverty, sickness, disease, or hurts, for we care for each other and watch one of his feet and love as he loved us. And are you doing that today? I pray it be so. For behold, how good it could be. Behold, how pleasant it could be. Behold, how wonderful it could be when brethren dwell together in unity.